everybody outside. And um, when we decided not to have the social aspect of this program, a lot of people were very upset. Um, they did not want to give up the social aspect and they wanted to have something to look forward to in the days of COVID. So we decided to try something new and um, using the all three floors to scatter about so we still have time to meet and greet our other incredibly members before the formal presentation. This experiment um, is the same for next month, just because we're gonna have the Maritime Tree. We are kicking that off um, this last uh, Thursday. We are selling biolightring.com. You can decorate the ring and then bring it back sometime the week of Thanksgiving and we can hang it on our back seat and we can stuck on our flagpole. And um, the uh, December 3rd, first Friday will coincide with the city's invitation night. The new Fairy Court Coral Society will start currently at 4.45 outside of the lawn, so please dress more. And then the tree will be lit at 5.30 um, before anyone can come in for our more special invitation evening. Kate Gilbert, who has been an icon for many, many holiday programs, 10 years running now, um, will continue the tradition. She will bring to light the diaries of Dorothy, Dorothea, Bolino, and who accompanied her husband Fred on a series of voyages throughout her married life. My background has been in American decorative arts. So when I left the pediatric museum, many asked, what does MIT have in their collection? Cavity magnetrons, engineering and architectural drawings, and of course, computers. I was told I was committing career suicide. <laughs> to some, those types of objects are or instruments have no place in a museum. <laughs> These utilitarian items are designed to perform a task, and once they are oblivious or obsolete, they are usually discarded or destroyed. These are not the types of objects passed down in the family, as <laughs> many decorative objects are typically cherished. <laughs> Harvard University has been acquiring scientific instruments on a continuous basis for teaching and research since 1672. Mm -hmm. The collection of the historical scientific instruments, which was established in 1948, to preserve this resource for teaching and research in the history of science and technology, has become one of the three largest collections of its kind in the world. Mm -hmm. Today, it has over 20,000 objects dating from the 1400s to the present. A broad range of scientific disciplines are represented, including astronomy, navigation, horology, surveying, geography, calculating, physics, biology, medicine, <laughs> psychology, electricity, and communication. <laughs> this evening, we have the honor of hosting Dr. Sarah Schnessner, who is the David P. Wheatman curator of the collection of Harvard's historic scientific instruments. Dr. Schechner earned her degrees in physics and history and philosophy of science from Harvard and Cambridge. Before returning to Harvard's history of department and science, sorry, history of science department, Dr. Schechner um, was chief curator at the Alder Planetarium in Chicago and curated exhibits in the Smithsonian Institution, the American Astro Astronomical Society and the American Physical Society. She is a historian of science specializing in material culture and the history of astronomy. At Harvard, she is a lecturer of history of science and has been on the faculty for the museum study program. She brings 40 years of museum and academic experience. Sarah has been deeply engaged in museum education through curated exhibits and object-based teaching for diverse Courses in Harvard. She regularly reenacts electrical experiments performed at the 18th century of Harvard and added a Frankenstein electrical show in 2018 in honor of the 200th anniversary of Mary Shelley's book. She has authored several books and served as the secretary of the Scientific Instrument Commission of the International Union for the History and Philosophy of Science and Technology and is chair of the historical. Astronomy Division of the American Astrological Society. 
She has also served on advisory boards for the Center of History for Science at the Royal Swedish Academy of Science and the American Institute of Physics and other organizations. She's currently the Vice President of the International Astronomical Union Commission C3 in the History of Astronomy and Vice President of the other organizations I just mentioned. <laughs> Too many episodes. In her spare time, which I'm hard to even believe because my head is swirling, she is an award winning quilt artist and enjoys Scottish dancing. So please welcome Dr. Shepherd. Thank you. Let me just put my. Up here. Okay, well, thank you for having me. And I hope you're all ready to have some fun learning about uh, how to navigate by seeing stars with some of the instruments I have laid out and that are part of this collection. Um, by the time I'm done, I think you should, you will have learned. Um, what all these instruments are on this title page from 1588, and then a few others, but I'll just point them out. We have Mariner's compass, dividers, a red and line, sea monster, of course, um, cross staff, Mariner's astrolabe, quadrant, a terrestrial globe, a big mirror, a celestial globe, another quadrant, another Mariner's astrolabe, another cross staff, a sand glass. Here and here, which would be used for time things on the ship, and various plumb lines coming down, dripping all over the place, and more. And you'll learn things beyond 1588, too. So um, let me uh, go to my next slide. Okay, so the thing I want to begin with is um, what the cosmos looked like for a lot of the instruments that we are going to be talking about. And um, in, uh, say, from the 16th century, this is the world you would be living in. Um, everything is going around the Earth. So we have here the Earth in the center, and then rings of um, uh, water, air, and fire, then the moon, the Mercury, Venus, the sun, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn, the sphere of fixed stars, and around the outside, the habitat of the elect, basically where the angels and saints are, and God is out here. And you can make this in a 3D model, which would look like this, and they did them out of brass, but it's an armor sphere. And each of these rings and circles represent um, parts of this, what's known as the sphere of fixed stars. So you have here the, um, the Earth in the center, rings of the planets going around. Um, the, uh, this would be the, um, like the celestial equator. And um, we have here the zodiacal band. The, you know, signs of the zodiac, which is also the path of the sun through the sky, uh, known as the ecliptic. And today we would say that's the plane in which all the planets move. Now, the reason I go through this is that all these instruments, even after Copernicus comes up with his idea that we should get rid of this and put the sun at the center and the earth and all the other planets going around the sun. Um, the basic aspects of this still all work perfectly for navigation. It really doesn't matter if the earth is moving or the sun is going around us, because what we see here on the earth is we are you know, set on a set place and we see the sun rise in the east and it moves through the southern part of the sky to a certain altitude each day. And then it sets in the west, and all the stars appear as if they're fixed on this, on a like a ball that's around us, and they're rotating around the earth. And we know today that the reason they're rotating is not that they're spinning around, but that the earth is rotating on its axis. 
but it doesn't matter. All we need to do is work on this presumption, like that we're fixed and these are all moving. So it's really just a, a mathematical state of hand that you can think one way or the other. So um, this is relevant and um, we will uh, um, come back to this as we go along. Um, so to, uh, so what was the known world at this point? So here I'm going to show you two, a pair of celestial globes that are in the collection at Harvard. These are about three and a half inches in diameter, and they're missing a part of their original scan, which would have been like a horizon scan. So they're on these like you know pedestals, which is a little odd for the period. But globes were often part of navigational kits, especially in the bigger ships, like if you were Sir Francis Drake sailing around or Sir Walter Raleigh. Smaller ships wouldn't have them, but they would help you to mark out territories and know where you were. This pair, they always came in pairs, a terrestrial globe and a celestial globe. And this pair um, is from the mid-16th century in French. And um, just to point out, this is the Terrestrial globe, you see how North America is not fully known. And here, if I, on this large area, if you said Hispania, Mayor, like large New Spain, because it was Spanish territory. And up here, you can make out a bit of it, it says Bacalea Regio. And that means in Latin, the land of Cod. So, so we were this area where we are right up here. Oh, I mean, all of like not Nova Scotia and the Canada there was the land of cod, and of course we know Cape Cod is got its name because there were big cod fisheries here. Um, when Captain John Smith um, was one of the first to really map New England, he's the one who in the early 17th century names this area in New England when he puts it on the map. Um, but, you know, Cape Cod was well known before that because there were fisheries that were Europeans were coming to off of Newfoundland and all the way down to Cape Cod. So I find that's kind of fun. Here's the celestial globe that's part of this pair. And, um, here are some details of the constellations on it. You can see that the stars are organized in these constellations. It's kind of a, a graphical finding aid. So you can say that star in the left shoulder of Orion is such and such. It's, it's an easier way than saying, look over there here. You know? um, even though they all have a mathematical position that astronomers would use called right a second ascension and declination. But we don't need to know so much about that for today's talk. And you know, the stars are marked in how bright they are. And um, they're all looking inward. You'll notice these constellations we're seeing a lot of backside. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> I wonder why is that? Um, and that's because um, First of all, this is the view of the sphere of fixed stars if the cosmos was like stars on a, on a ball shaped sphere. Um, this is the view from outside our universe. It's a God's eye view looking back towards the earth, which would be in the center of the sphere. And, and the constellations, the way we've drawn them and mapped are facing us. So, you know, Orion's like this, and he's not like this, you know. So it's important that they're drawn this way on um, when you're using a globe because you want to be, keep some consistency with um, uh, left and right and up and down so that if the guy's reversed, then what's the left shoulder of Orion from one view is not his proper left from another view. So. There's, you can have a lot of license in how you draw them, like when you put clothes on them and so forth, but you, uh, there's certain, um, since the time of Hipparchus, which is like the second century 
uh, BCE, this is a convention that astronomers have followed, and it's still in use today. Uh, okay. Um, the other thing that, um, uh, so let's move on. So how do we initially find our way around? And one of the earliest methods was to find a way by wind direction and the compass. Um, here we see um, some winds blowing on the earth and um, on the right, a um, what's known as a windrose. And it's a diagram that looks very familiar. It looks like our mariner's compasses, right? Well, our mariner's compasses get this image from the original wind rows, which were on maps for sailing before the compass was invented. So the compass, the map, the magnetic compass doesn't get to Europe until around the 12th or 13th century. It's really rather late. Um, there, it was invented in China earlier, but we, it was not here in uh, Europe until this uh, later part of the Middle Ages. So um, they had already been sailing by these charts that would have wind directions on them. And these were known as Portland charts. And so they would have these, these um, wind roses because they look like roses and um, you know, with points of direction sailing up. And we're gonna see some of these charts in a slide coming up. These are the names of the Italian winds. And so that you could name them by cardinal directions, north, south, east, west, and so on, or you can name them by the names of winds like Sirocco and Oslo and so forth. Um, and you can see they're also over here. And what we'll notice too on these is that um, very early we have the fleur de lis at north. Um, and often at the east point, like you see, it's a little faint here, and it's off the screen a bit on this side. Um, we will see often a cross, and that's there because that most of the sailing was done in the Mediterranean, and the, that was the east was the direction of the Holy Land. Mm -hmm. So that is also featured on these compasses. Um, here is a detail of a wind rose on a compass card. So this card has a magnetic needle underneath and it floats, so to speak, on a pivot point in a mariner's compass. And um, here is a detail of that compass. Um, this one was made in London around 1675 by a maker named Edward Mann. And uh, Benjamin Franklin helped to pick it out for Harvard when he was in London in that period as kind of Harvard's personal shopper, spending Harvard money um, after a fire burnt up all his other equipment for the most part. So, and these matters, compasses have um, the box they're in is known as the binnacle. So you may think of the binnacle as that big metal, like diver dam looking thing with big cannonballs on it. But the binnacle, that's like a later version of the binnacle. The binnacle initially is just a box. And, um, and the addition of cannonballs and other things in it is to help balance the magnetic field of these later metal ships that would throw your compass off. Now here I'm going to show you a detail of a mariner's compass in the Customs House Maritime Museum, and um, it's by E and G W Blunt. Um, and again, you see the the sort of the ignore, and it's black and white. Um, anybody have an idea why it might be black and white instead of color? I'm sorry. It's printing. Well, one thing is that these are printed, but it's also because it's easier to see at night, and you want to watch it all the time as you're steering your ship. And black and white is more contrast. It's not as pretty, but 
And I'm going to put on the gloves here to do this curatorial thing. But I have this compass here. And so after my talk, I encourage you to come up because I realize I can't really hold them up. So I'm going to be doing a mixture of talking about range of instruments, showing real ones that are in the collection here, and also using slides like this to give you a little you know, more detail than you could see to me up here. So here is this compass. It's not very big. And the box that it's in is its binnacle. And you see it has a cover also to protect it. So that slides off. And then you have in here this lovely little compass. Now, as I'm tipping it, you'll notice it's staying level. And that's because it's in something called gimbals. And this is very nice because if you're on a rocking ship, you want to keep your compass as level as possible. And there's a line in here which you can't see, but is oriented, um, it's painted inside the bowl, and that's called the lover's line. And that's what you align with the fore and aft line of your ship. Mm -hmm. So you would put it down in this one, it's, um, where is it? It's right here, it happens to be right here. So I would put this compass down like this, line it up with my ship. And this would probably then also be in a protective like cabinet near where you, you're, the helm of the ship where you're steering so that you can steer by these compass directions. Um, now, uh, later compasses, um, you know, you would have for something like this at night, you wanna see it, it's, you know, besides just, the ambient lights, so you'd have a lantern separate to bring nearby. Now, this is an example from the Customs House Maritime Museum here, which is um, the binnacle is made of copper, and you have a compass inside protected behind glass. Uh, this is sort of late 19th, early 20th century. And in this door here that opens and closes is a space for a, a little lantern where you put in some oil and you could ignite it and that would go back in here. And there's a little nice little drawer here for your matches. And, and then this whole thing closes up and I'm gonna to try to close it a little now. And you see it also has on the back it looks like a big belt hook, you know? So it could sit, it probably sat on a rail or something that helped to keep it from moving around. There was a spot for it. And the protection of the compass behind this glass door and this enclosure would keep wind and other elements from affecting it. So this is a later style of binnacle and compass. All right. Um, so, um, advanced compass knowledge, have you ever wondered what's underneath the card of a compass on these compasses? What do you think is under there? Metal, some metal, something that we can magnetize, right? I'm sorry? The earth. the earth, well, we're all under that, yes. <laughs> it's definitely relating to our magnetic field of the earth. So I got curious and I started picking them apart, which sometimes curators can do. Uh, so this is a, um, a little pocket sundial. It's about um, two inches um, across. And, uh, but it has a kind of, a uh, floating compass card that these earlier maritime compasses had. And um, so here you see it open and different details of it, including the sundial portion. And this type of sundial needs a compass for aligning it properly. So when you flip it over, um, there's the compass card on the left. And on the right, you see the, um, the paper pasting down a, um, a, a wire that's shaped 
like a diamond, and that is the magnetized needle on this kind of compass. So now if we go to um, uh, a mariner's compass like the one I showed you here um, by, um, I don't know if I ever told you, this one was by um, Edmund Blunt and George William Blunt, two brothers um, in New York. And uh, his father, Fishy, was up here in Newburyport um, before moving to New York. Um, so this compass, this is one on the screen here, is by Samuel Baxter, son of Boston. It's from the same period as the blunt compass. And um, so on the left, we have it in its pinnacle. And then the second image shows I've taken the glass cover off the um, the compass ball, and then I removed the cards. You see a point that's sticking up to hold it. And now when we look at the card itself, on the under, so there's the card on the upper left, and then uh, you'll see it's made of layers. Um, this one has um, uh, a layer of mica, here to stiffen the card, which is unusual. You don't see that always. Um, and then some scrap paper on the back um, to sandwich the front of the card with, you know, and the mic and make a sandwich. What's very interesting here is uh, Samuel Baxter shop took an advertisement of the rivals, um, E and G W blunt, and stuck it as a stiffener on the underside of this card, which is really cheeky, I think. Um, and, um, and the other stuff is just, so here the needle is now like a flat metal bar of iron, it's rusty, and, but that would be magnetized. And all these splotches here, and here's a detail of one of them, that's sealing wax. And so this would be added to the underside of your compass to make it uh, balance better and be level because sometimes with age or you know increased attraction of water and moisture and things it would become unbalanced and in certain parts of the earth too the magnetic field is dips it doesn't just go level so they were trying to make it as straight as possible so the high tech way was to put sealing wax on different parts until it balanced. And often when you turn them over, you see often signatures of different makers who have recalibrated or repaired the compass. So they sign their name and date. So you can see the compass went here, there, and everywhere um, for this purpose. Now, an important thing when you have a magnetic compass on a ship is to have a whole bunch of lodestones. Now, lodestones are naturally magnetic rocks. And um, you, you cannot run the risk of losing the magnetism of your compass needle. Um, if your ship, is, you know, it could just go awry of its own. If your ship is struck by lightning or has some other electrical effects from a storm, as a, there's a famous scene in Moby Dick where this happens, the cards will lose their magnetism and then they will not point correctly. And so every ship would always have some lodestones. Um, more often they are like the one on the left, um, a rock found in some grass. And there's always like a pair of iron bars that come down the side and that create a at the bottom, two points that are would be marked as the poles, the north and south pole. So this also helps you so you know where which way the the, the, the magnet, the lodestone is um, polarized. Otherwise, you just have a rock and you're like, okay, well, which way do I rub my needle? Uh, the other thing was sailors could always make their own magnetic compasses from sewing needles. And on these sailing ships, they always have plenty of needles to repair their sail. So that was another reason to have the lodestone. And then this one on the right is a very fancy one. It's clad in silver. And so also part of the Harvard collection. 
and he has this beautiful um, windrows here in the floor of me, and over here, um, this is the top, and this is the bottom, and you see the two points in the poles, you see the leaves drawn. So it's just very beautiful piece of work. So we know how we're sailing, um, in what direction by the winds. The, the next thing that is very critical, especially in early maritime work, is how much water is beneath the keel of your boat. And um, so for this purpose, they had uh, something called a sounding lead or a leaded line. And um, these were uh, metal, they might be bronze, they might be lead, literally lead, um, and they would be on a spool and it'd be calibrated in fathoms so that you could drop this over the side. Like you see our, our Renaissance sailor here is dropping his down and um, uh, it would, you wait till it touched bottom and then you could haul it up and see how deep the water was there. And it, there was always a hollow at the bottom where you could put some tallow or wax. So when you dropped it down, it would pull up some of the stuff at the bottom of the water, the sea or the harbor. And so you could see what that material was. And these were marked on, shop, on charts. This is uh, I'm seeing, uh, a chart from the mid 19th century of Cape Cod. But all these numbers are all the sounding numbers So how many, how deep the water is here in feet or fathoms. And then these other things like WH.S would stand for white sand. And um, over here, it's, uh, so here we have something, uh, broken shells as abbreviation for there and fine white sand, I forget what, G stands for, but so they also tell you by knowing the depth of the water and um, what was at the bottom, you could help to know where you were in the harbor, which was really a critical thing as you were also trying to match the tides and not run aground. So as I mentioned, here's a portal on a chart. Um, this one is, uh, um, from the 16th century. And um, here I'm just showing part of the Mediterranean, North Africa, Spain. And you see these wind roses here, it's either cross on the eastern point of Puerto Rico North. And you would sail on these run lines according to these wind directions or compass directions. And if you wanted to go from one place to another, you figure out what run line to sail. Like on here, I want to go to Sardinia, I would sail on this run line and uh, to get there. Now, this all works really great if you're in the Mediterranean where, you know, it's not that far across. Um, the other way they would sail was to just hug the coast. And, you know, so. He wouldn't generally come out here and go Whoa, look to here. He would sort of sail around where you had, um, you know, landmarks, which was helpful. But that's not um, very expedient at times. So what happens if you, you know, want to get away from the visible landmarks? You know, it's fine to hug the coast of Europe and North America, but you know, if you want to go. Um, say further south um, uh, or across the oceans, then you need to know how to find your position on the sea by the stars, and the sun, and, uh, and or and this is usually a combination of things, dead reckoning. And then we'll say a few more about, a little more about that. So, um, So fortunately, um, the, to know how far north or south you are is to know, you could know this by your latitude. And um, here we have a little instrument 
from a book from 1524 rotates and it's demonstrating how the angle of elevation of a pole star above the horizon is equal to the person's latitude on that part of the globe. Um, and how do we find, you know, often the easy way to find the pole star was to, um, you know, um, use what we call the Big Dipper, Middle Dipper, or, you know, the Big Bear, Ursa Major, Ursa Minor, so if you follow the stars of the bucket up to this star here, the tail of the Little Bear, and the Middle of the Middle Dipper, mm -hmm. that's the pole star. And, and that, those were constellations that were easily seen. So um, let me pull out my portable planetarium here. Um, <laughs> so let me stay here. So, so here is, um, it's hard to see with the backlight, but this, this, this umbrella which has the stars on the interior. This is the equivalent that handles the Earth's axis. And the, the point, this is like the North Pole, really a pole up there. So if I'm watching the stars, you know, um, you know, first of all, they're because of the Earth's rotation, they're we're, we're turning once around every 24 hours around that pole star, which is fixed. And if I'm if I were at the North Pole, that would be directly overhead. And you know, the pole star would be there. And if I'm at the equator, it's like on my horizon or just off the edge, and the stars would be rotating like that. But everywhere in between, this angle from the horizon up is, is our latitude. And that's what a lot, almost all these instruments on this table that I'm now about to show you are all working with that piece of information. And you can play with this after this one. Okay, like two umbrellas. Multiple people can play. Okay, so how do we find our angles? So one good old standard instrument was the quadrant, and um, here you see uh, a woodcut with. I love this astronomia, this, the muse of astronomers, Helen Ptolemy, the great astronomer. How to do it, right? Yeah. <laughs> you know, um, we don't get many roles in these things, but, and this is a, a not very good replica of a quadrant, but it, um, it, it would be something like this size if you made of wood. It would have a pair of sights and you would hold it up and you would sight the pole star through there and you measure where the plumb line fell and that angle would give you your latitude. And, and you could also use it by day with the sun when a whale is swimming a little bit. Um, if you want to try playing around with a quadrant, you can um, easily make your own with a straw and some like piece of card straw, a string and a, you know, a bit of hardware at the bottom. And it will work just as well. You could go out and try it. And you can you know, try it in a room, just seeing what the angle from where you're standing to a part of the room is. All right. Um, the other way, so quadrant was one way. Um, the next instrument that was often used for this was the astrolabe. And the astrolabe is um, an instrument that is invented in about the fifth century AD and um, or CE. And an astrolabe would look something like this. This is a replica. Um, it's a very complicated instrument. If anyone wants to know more of how you use it, I can tell you after the lecture because I'm going to take time now. But on this side, you have all these star pointers. It's basically you take them like that arm lace, you're a model of the universe, and you squish it down onto a single plane with a special mathematical characteristics. And then these, these stars, each of these pointers represents a star. And as you move it, 
rotating, it's rotating, they're rotating around the, the North Pole and they're rising in Saturn. And on the back, you have um, a number of instruments, but the key thing here is um, an alidae, which is a sighting rule. So you hold it up and you sight your star through that. And then along a, a, the scale here would be divided. You could find your app, you know, to how many degrees above the horizon that is. Um, now, this is expensive and fancy, and it's got all these um, various plates that are embedded in here, like they're stacked inside. And it does a lot more than just find your latitude. You can find time of sunrise and sunset and the day of the year, what stars are above, and gas horoscopes, and um, all sorts of stuff that you don't need for the finding latitude. So the um, around, um, so like when Columbus goes, um, sails for this part of the earth, He's using a kind of stripped down astrolabe that looks just like the back of an astrolabe without all the star points. And then um, at the early 16th century, this new navigational instrument's device called the Mariner's Astrolabe. And this is an, another replica. And now you see we've stripped everything down, we just have the holiday, the sighting rule, and we have the the divided scale so for measured angles and it's got holes in it so the wind can blow through so otherwise the wind would push against the flat plate so and you know weighs a lot and um, so this this becomes the new instrument and the one up here that I'm showing you is is from a shipwreck so very few of these original Mariners estimates survive. Um, and that's because, and we usually find them in shipwrecks. <laughs> so it gives you a little wondering about you know, the usefulness, but uh, the fact is that, uh, the fact is that, you know, if, as technology moved along, they would have gotten melted down. You know, there's a lot of brass or bronze in them that can be put to another purpose. They're not as beautiful as the planisphere gasoline, which survived more. So this one came from a shipwreck off the part of Natosha that was carrying all sorts of jewels from the Spanish New World back and sunk in a hurricane. Um, so it's very sober, but that's what uh, um, one would look like. Now the quadrant and the astrolabe were well known in the Middle Ages. You know, they were even a goat and bear knew how to use them, I guess. And um, and so they're they're the first instruments that navigators turn to um, for these this help. Um, but in the mid 15th century, the Portuguese sailed south of the equator down the coast of Africa. And they realized, wait a minute, we can't use the pole star to find our latitude. It's, we can't see it anymore. Well, south of the equator, once you go south of the equator, it's just not visible. Um, so um, they have to develop a new method of navigation, which becomes popular, which is to use the midday sun. And um, as you see here, um, from this text by Pedro Medina, you have you can hold your astrolabe like this, and you let the sunlight come through one bay of the alley and to the other, so you don't have to blind yourself with the sun, like looking directly at it, so it's coming through. And then when you have the spot of light created by the hole at the top alley, it falls on the hole at the bottom. You lined up and you now can measure your altitude of the sun. And then from that, you have to do a little more correction for the sun's altitude on that day of the year, something called solar declination. Because the sun, this is why we have longer days in the summer and the sun gets higher during the day. Um, 
at noon than it is in the winter where the ski of shorter days and the sun doesn't get as high in the sky. And that's because the sun and its path in our sky changes by 23 and a half degrees north of the equator, 23 and a half south of the equator. Um, and uh, so, so there's a, not really a question, but this is um, a well-known one. You can have tables of it and you would just easily then find your latitude. So now you're finding it not just at night, you're also finding it at day and anywhere on the globe. Another instrument that comes from the Middle Ages, but becomes really popular for navigation in the 16th century is the cross there. And so what this is, is a staff and it's divided with degrees on uh, the staff and you have a, a sliding vein that goes up and down. And you have a set of veins, some larger, some smaller, depending on the angles. And so you hold it up to your eye and try not to poke your eye out. And you move this vein up and down. And at the same time, you sight, you know, the whole, you try to line this part up with the horizon and this part up with the star you're looking at or the sun and keeping them both in the same view while you're on the rock and ship. Um, <laughs> You uh, you find your latitude or the angle of what you're looking at, um, and I always think that's why all those pirates have the eye patches. <laughs> but um, <laughs> uh, here in the slide, you see someone like uh, using it to look at you know the North Pole star and find latitude, and someone else was just aware of the star it could be the sun. So these, curiously, so um, these remained very popular into the 18th century, um, and uh, they were used by a lot of mariners in the so in the 1500s, and then primarily by the Dutch in the 1700s and the 1800s. And the Dutch really, you know, they kept at it. Uh, other, the other, there were these different styles. So the Spanish and Portuguese preferred the mariners instrument. The Dutch preferred this instrument, the cross staff. And um, the um, the English uh, said, "This is great. I mean, you know, this is kind of hard to use." And so in um, 1570, 1590, this fellow named John Davis comes up with this newer, better, or so he thought, thing called the Davis Backstaff or the Davis Quadrant. And the Mariners Museum has a lovely one. And this is it. And um, this is unusual because it has one of the veins survives. There would have been another vein here and another one here. And we have a divided scale here and another one here. And so you would, the benefit here was you put the sun behind you. You don't have to look directly at the sun. So that's a benefit. So you would sight the horizon through this lower vein. And you would adjust this vein so that the shadow coming through it falls on the horizon. So you get that approximately what you thought your latitude was. And then this scale is much more finely divided. And you push, keeping that shadow on that horizon and moving this one up and down, you would line them all up. So you're seeing straight through with the shadow line. And then you'd read off the angle on this scale and on this scale and add them. And that would give you your angle. And um, these were pretty precise. They were um, divided to, um, you know, often uh, fractions of a degree, you know, or maybe um, not just every five degrees, or, you know, they'd be um, into like tenths of a degree and stuff. So they had a method of subdividing the scale here that's quite clever. Um, this is probably English. Uh, made, I mean, or American made. It could have been made in Newburyport or someplace 
in New England. Um, it is probably mid 18th century. And it's really quite lovely. You know, you have a mixture of different woods. Um, the ones with the scales are lighter colored, and this is more like an ebony or fruit woods, more brown. So that's the backstep. Now, the problem with the backstep is you need the sun, but well, you get the sun out of your eyes, but your, your, your hose, if you don't have any sun or it's night, whereas a mariner's astrolabe or the cross step and these other things work at night. But that was the angle measuring tool of that day. So let's see. Uh, as you were kind of guessing, these are all kind of uh, tricky to use. And it's amazing you don't have more shipwrecks with these things. So um, what we can, the biggest uh, improvement on all this technology comes in around 1730 when um, John Hadley in London and Thomas Godfrey in Philadelphia simultaneously invent what gets known as Hadley's quadrant because Hadley had no power, um, but some better connections. But it is an instrument for finding the angles um, between stars and the horizon or the sun. And, um, the benefit of it is that I'm going to show you some here from the collection. So this one is from um, 18th century. This one is um, from about 1790. Let me just show you an early version though of what these look like. Not that this guy's picture of those. I have one. So the early surviving, they're they're known as an octave as well as how these quadrant because. The scale here is, if you look at this pie shape, it's an eighth of a circle. But because there's a mirror here and a mirror here, this, the stars or sun, the reflection that comes over here, bounces to this mirror, and then bounces back to this sighting piece here. Um, and I'm going to show you where I hold one up. And, and, as you move this index over, you're adjusting this mirror. And so you, because of the reflections, you only need 45 degrees, an eighth of a circle, to mark off 90 degrees on a scale. So it's known as an octave, but it's also known as a quadrant, because a quadrant is a quarter of a circle and it's 90 degrees, an octave is an eighth of a circle, and that's the physical characteristic. <laughs> And um, this is the earliest surviving octave in the world. It's at Harvard. And um, we have a little magnifier here that we go in scale so you can finally read these fractions of degrees. This one was tested um, at sea in about 1733 by the inventor's brother, George Hadley. Um, so um, before I show you the ones from here, I'm just going to put up, this is a typical ebony octave. And I'm going to show you examples of these in the collection. And um, as you see, we have the, the movable index arm. And we also have this little pencil and a little pen here that are really clever. Mm -hmm. And so I'm going to explain that. So, OK, now we look at the end. So this is a beautiful octant. It's marked on the case with Richard Johnson. And um, we don't know who he is. He's probably a ship captain, or this was his personal instrument. It's called a step case. So as we open it, I'm going to pull the octant out. I'm going to show you the case in a moment. So here's the octant. And you have, you're using the frame as a handle. And as I move this arm, it's adjusting this mirror. And I would look through this little sight here, the whole sight, at this half silver glass here. So part I see the horizon, part I see the reflection of what's coming from this mirror. So I'd line those two up. And when they're lined up, I would have to read off this ivory scale, the degree. So I can measure angles of anything, but I could use it for latitude. I could 
And this one is missing its sunshades, which I'll show you, but it had this device to protect your eyes, like sunglasses, um, when you were um, you were using it. Um, let me just make a space here. Move this fellow out of the way. And um, so I want to I'm going to pick up another octant here. It's like the ebony octant. So this one is bit bigger, it's earlier. This one is um, like the one you see in that picture. Um, it's also made in London with an ivory scale. The ivory is partly so you can see it at night. And you know, again, you have the pinhole sight here. And now we start to see these shades. These are like sunglass shades of different colors. You might be able to see if I hold it up there. The, the red, green, like the dark gray. And you can use them in one or more combinations to protect your eyes from the sun and glare if you're looking at like the noonday sun. And um, what was here was a little pencil. It's all missing. And you pull it out and you make your measurement and then you scribble on the back this handy little ivory pad what your measurement was. And then you might make another site and scribble it. And then you go in, the navigator would go into his logbook and mug down what he found and make any calculations. So this was like a nice little built-in you know, <laughs> accessory. Um, and it's, I have a couple of, as we look closely at these and their cases, we um, see a number of interesting things. So this is the first often case we looked at. Um, and what you can, so I'm going to show you some, uh, uh, some images of it in a moment, but we have here, you see, it's a little hard to see, but there are chalk numbers on this side, as well as trade cards of different people who sold the octant or repaired it at different times. Um, and let me just, uh, before I show you the close-ups of that, this is a sextant. So what is a sextant? The sextant is essentially a sutra octant. And the biggest difference is it's, it's a six of a circle, um, which is why it's called a sextant. So instead of measuring 90 degrees, it measures 120 degrees. But also, it's now made all of brass. It's very rigid. It's got a silver inlay scale. Um, it's got a telescopic sight. It's got handles. It's so it's more accurate. And this is because they wanted something that can measure larger angles for help in finding longitude. Um, the sextant is invented around 1760, so it's about 30 years after the octant. Um, and the two coexist throughout the 19th century. And you even have quintets that are fifths of a circle and other kinds of combinations. But the sextant. Um, you know, here we have the reading microscope, um, various, this was in the box, there are a number of different telescopes that you can use for different sites, a number of shades to protect your eye, um, a handle, you can see it's rigid. Um, and uh, so this allowed you to measure angles more closely. And, uh, I'll explain in a little bit why you want, why the sextant is needed as opposed to the octant for finding longitude. But let's just quickly. Okay, so here is a picture of the octant by Gilbert and Wright that I showed you first in its case. And you can see here the chalk numeral. So, you know, you imagine you're on a ship and the, you now have this great instrument and the great benefit of this is no matter how the ship is rocking the image you see of the horizon and the stars is steady because of this um, reflection system 
So it's much easier to use than like poking your eye out with the cross staff, okay? And um, so everyone says, okay, that's great. Um, except the Dutch who keep using the cross staff for a while longer. But um, it then, uh, when you make a measurement, if you don't have that little pad, also it's easier to scribble on your case. You don't want, and that's what we see here, evidence of that. So, you know, you're on a ship, it's windy, it's maybe wet, you're not gonna have like a good board out there with paper, or, you know, it's gonna blow around. So you just have your case and you scribble on there and you can rub it off later if you want. Sometimes we find pencil marks, white chalk marks and things like that in these cases. And this is a really good example of that. So I wanted to point that out, like what, what we learn from these objects. Um, when we look at the, um, we also learn where they went. So here are two trade cards in this case. So Gilbert and Wright of London made this often between 1790 and 1792. And um, the trade card from Liverpool on the left, which tells us a lot about this guy's business in Liverpool, Dawson and Melling, um, we know he existed in 1837. So that's 50 years after this octet was made, it's still in use enough to get to Dawson and Dawson and Melling's shop to be fixed, repaired, resold. Um, it's not just seen as yesterday's old model. And then we have on the right, um, uh, the trade card of Tristram Coffin, the third of Newbury Court. So I don't know anything, couldn't find anything about him except what's on this trade card that his shop was on Merrimack Street in Newbury Court, and he keeps constantly for sale war you know, warranted quadrants, uh, brass and wood compasses of various kinds, spy glasses with the telescopes. Time glasses, or the sand glasses, scales and dividers, et cetera, et cetera. And also, you know, board and timber and wood, rhinestones and other things like for, for the hardware store. But, um, you know, so one could go, and so it has this, it's probably a 19th century label. So this, this, this often is in use for quite a while. One point is repair. We know it was here in Newburgh for when Tristram Coffin had his hands on it. We know it was in Liverpool at some point. So we now have this story of this object and it has the name of someone on the outside of the case, uh, Richard um, Johnson. We don't know who he is, but maybe some further research will turn up that he is a captain of a ship or somebody knowledgeable, you know, that we can find out in city records or what have you. Um, and uh, this little piece is just traveling around the case. It doesn't belong to it, so it will stay there. Mm -hmm. So um, that's the story of this one. Um, this one here, I'm gonna, is another option in the collection. And um, so this one is by Spencer Brown and Rust, who were in business from 1784 to 1800. And um, what we see when we look at this octet and its case closely, we see, first of all, that it says here SBR on this IV scale, which means they used a new tool, a dividing engine for marking those lines more precisely up until the end of the 18th century. All these calibrations were done by hand, by trial stepping with dividers. So it was a lot less accurate. So they're advertising, you know, this is engine dividing scale, we look closely. Um, when we look at the signature on the cross piece, we see Spencer Brown and Russ London, then underneath it says H. Dorman, it's hard to read in my bad photo, New York. Now, um, Henry Dorman was a New York maker and reseller. And he was in business 
1852 to 1861, where Spencer, Browning, and West were as early as 1784 to 1840. So now we have this range of which this oxy is being used. Um, and then uh, there are two more cards in here. Um, one is uh, Samuel Thaxter of Boston. Um, 17, who's in business, 1796 to 1822. And then there's James Bastian in Liverpool, who's a bit later in the 1830s, let's say, to 1850s. So there's a lot of information here about the cars and where the thing went and how it was so well loved and got repaired with this crude piece of wood on it. And um, so we, you know, it, I don't mean that facetiously. Eventually, someone is trying to take care of it and keep it going. And um, you know, maybe it's someone who can't afford a new case or what have you. But this is just the way they want it. So these things are they tell whole stories that one could trace out from the object that's not written anywhere else but in the object. And um, this is the sextant I showed you. Uh, so it was made like 1840 to 1870, and it has a trade card in here of um, Frederick um, Walker Lincoln Jr. Um, and company. So we know they're in business in Boston, 1858 until 1883. And just for um, curiosity, Frederick Walker Lincoln Jr. was a descendant of Paul Revere and um, at one point mayor of the city of Boston. So there's all these connections. Um, all right. So let's talk about dead reckoning and finding longitude. So let me just uh, make a little space here. There we go. Um, Okay, so um, dead reckoning and finding longitude. So, how did people know how far they had gone, you know, on their ships? We know the direction was sailing, and then we need to know okay, we want to measure the speed of the ship and figure how far we got on our chart or where we think we are. So, the first method is and well used up proven 19th century is dead reckoning, um, aptly named. So dead reckoning was first you would, um, the earliest form of this was to throw a piece of trash off the bow of your ship and you knew the length of your ship and you would let, your ship would sail past the trash and when it got to the end of the ship, you would know that it had gone that distance. And how did you measure the time of that? You might, sailors might be using a little ditty or a bunch of words, and they would know that took so long. And so the speed that it got to where they got to in their little song would tell them, okay, the ship is going X, mile, X knots an hour or what have you. So many miles an hour. Now that um, you can improve that by having a sand glass or some other measuring device to time it besides just singing. Mm -hmm. um, but that, you know, this is the method that is going all the way up to um, the, the great achievement of um, technology. Of 1574, this high tech invention of the late 16th century is the log in line. So let me bring this over here. It's still late, too. Okay. So the log in line was here's one from the collection here, and basically a spool of a rope and the rope is knotted every seven or eight fathoms. So every 
42 to 48. And you have this thing called the log ship, which is behind it. And this um, gets, so at a center, and you have a sand glass, um, which uh, would look like these. And um, they would run for, say, about 28 seconds was a typical thing. So you would toss this into the water behind the ship. And this would be um, not in here, I think, on this one. And this, so this would, um, you, this is designed and weighted so that it would float in the water vertically. So you don't want to drag it, you want to sail away from it. And so when this hit the water, and um, the one sailor would turn the sand glass and keep an eye on it, and someone would be holding this spindle. Usually, they can be much bigger than this, these are smaller, part of a smaller ship. And this would play out the rope. And when the sand ran out in the sand glass, which is called a log glass because it's known as a log in mine, um, when the sailor was watching the sailors would say, stop, mark something. And the sailor with the line here would grab it and stop it from continuing playing out. And when you grab it sharply, it, it pulls this um, pin out. And now the string is immediately flat. So it's easier to drag back in. And as you wind this back up, you count the knots that played out as it ran out. And the number of knots gives you the speed of your ship and knots. This is where that expression comes from, real knots on real rope. OK? Now, this um, has, um, so the next stage was they would have something like this called a traverse board. And here's a real one. This is uh, one my dear husband made for me for this kind of purpose. But they're wood and they don't survive very well. But the traverse board is marked with the windrows. And so you would toss the log, it's called heaving the log, like every half hour on the watch. And the watch might be a couple of hours. And there's uh, the rhythm of the boat and the crew goes. So you would say, okay, at uh, the first half hour, you would say, we're sailing, you know, northeast. So you'd go to the first ring in this and you put a peg in the point of sail that you're going. And then down below, you say, how fast were we going? Okay, we were sailing three knots. So you put a peg in that first row at three. And, then, and there's some fractional pet points here, like quarter knots and stuff you could put in too. And then half hour later, you do it all again. And now you say, okay, we changed direction. We're now sailing um, more northerly. So I'm gonna put the peg in the second circle or in the northern point. And I'm gonna put another peg here in the second row. And now we're going, we're really moving along here. We're going you know, six knots or whatever. And you build this up. So this is a way for sailors who don't have to read or write to know how to graphically keep track as they heave the log of the course that the ship is going. And so after the four turns are done, you usually have four like you see here, then um, the navigator, you know, someone higher up on the crew, would grab this and note down in the log book. We, you know, for this, from time X to time B, we were going this fast in this direction. Then the next half hour, we we're going this fast in that direction. And then they could take out their chart later and mark it on the chart and try to figure out where they thought they were from where they started based on how fast they were going and where they thought they were. Now, this is all fine and good, except that um, you need to know 
Um, there are various errors that are built in because, and there was a lot of debate among astronomers and mathematicians trying to tell the sailors, you know, how to do it better. And they said, well, you um, should the knots be spaced this far apart or that far apart. Should the sandals be 28 seconds or 30 seconds or 24 seconds or 26 seconds and so forth. And, um, but they, they knew there weren't what they called certain errors in the method, but they also said, let's build in error and let's estimate that we're going faster than we know we're going. So anyone have a guess why you want to think you're faster than you are? Current? Um, exactly. You want to know, you want to think you're ahead of where you are so you can be on the lookout for the dangerous stuff. Mm -hmm. So you want to predict your, that you're further along on your chart than you are. Because if you're, if you think you're further back and you're suddenly on that shoal or that rock or whatever, it's too late. So it's better to think it's coming up, it's almost there, and then the crew can be on the lookout or the crow's nest or whatever to watch out for that. So it's like they made this system and then they said, okay, now we're going to take it apart a bit and make it not work as well because it's safer that it shouldn't work as well as long as we know we're erring on one side and not the other. So this is, as you can guess, though, it's pretty crude, and you don't know uh, where um, you are. But they still are working with this method of dead reckoning, and um, the museum here has a, a, a lovely innovation on this method. And uh, here's one from Harvard. And this is a mechanical log um, and what this does is instead of throwing this log chip off the back, which sometimes called a flounder because it looks flat, you toss this off the back of your boat. And this has the rotors would spin. This one is kind of frozen up, so I'm not going to try. And under here, there's a set of dials. And here I can show you um, Harvard's dials. But if you walk around, I'm going to go, this is the one I'm holding. So it has this cover, you open it up, and these dials will turn as the rotor turns. And one dial marks uh, tens of miles, one is marking single miles, and one is marking fractions of miles. And um, you would uh, you know, put this in the water, and you time it with the sand glass. At the end of the time, you pull it out, and you would read how far um, you would go on. You might leave it in the water longer to get a better average. Um, this one, it says that it is the new patent frictionless improved mechanical law of um, Edward Massey of London, probably made about 1875. Um, and uh, the, um, it's interesting too, because um, it has on it this little, this little symbol, which is three L's. You can um, kind of find here, you see right here, it says improved log LLL. So I was wondering what that was, and that stands, it's for part of the Mariner's Creed, um, which, um, was something the mariners were supposed to like you know say on a regular basis, and the L stand for log, lead, and lookout as the things that the sailor must watch out for um, uh, to be sailing safely. So this is the log of the line. We had the sounding lead and looking out. Often the Mariner's Creed has four L's and the other L is latitude. So you want to know your latitude, 
You want to know how much water is underneath you. You want to always keep your eye out. And you want to know best you're going so you can figure out where you think you are by bad graphing. Now, um, the problem though is if so, the way you would sail, because you wanted to sail from England to Newburyport, the way you would do it in um, the colonial era would be to you would come out of your port in England, wherever you were, you'd sail north or south to the latitude of Newburyport, and then you'd run along that latitude till you got here. Okay? Now, and you'd estimate by dead reckoning where you thought you were on that course. The biggest problem is, okay, a storm comes up. All right, you know, you bounced around, and finally it's clear. You get out your compass, you figure out, okay, we're sailing here. You take out, you find your quadrant, or depending on where you cross it, where you back it, you figure out your latitude. Fine, okay, now I, I can go north or south to the right latitude to get back up. <laughs> But how far east to west am I from where I thought I was before I got the going off course, right? And when we look at globes, like there were these at the period, these little pocket globes, this is a replica, um, they would often show the courses of, you know, big explorers, famous explorers like Captain Cook, who did his English globe, or Magellan, if it was, you know, a Spanish globe, whatever. And um, when you look at their paths, you see them zigzagging a lot. <laughs> and that's because they get blown off and then they'd sail one way. Okay, you think, oh, wait, that, that doesn't feel right. I think we overshot it, so we have to go back this way. And then they say, um, maybe not. Okay, we're going this way to get to that island. And so you see that on these maps of their tracks, and that's what's going on. And the thing is, so this is why so many ships go down because of not knowing where they were on the globe from dead reckoning. Mm -hmm. it, it's, it's, it's better than no reckoning, but it is dead reckoning. So, <laughs> so this becomes the big problem of how to find longitude. And if I've heard about this, so, Everyone knew from as early as this book was published in like the 1520s, that there were two methods for finding longitude. One was to use the, the stars and the position of the moon, the distance of certain stars to the moon, and you could measure on sea and compare the tables um, to find your longitude with some careful calculations. And this is here you see a guy, two guys, some guys with cross tabs, and what they're doing is showing how they're using lunar distances between a star and a moon to figure out where they are relative to each other. The other method also recommended in this book is carry a good clock. But there are no good clocks at this point in time um, that um, are that accurate and affordable and are seaward. I mean, 1520s, 30s, they don't even have a pendulum clock, you know. So plus a pendulum clock won't work on a rocking ship. So the, the challenge comes to find, to improve these two methods. In the 18th century, the British, um, most famously, the British Board of Longitude has a competition. Who can build the best clocks to carry at sea and who can develop the best lunar distance method? So for the lunar distance method, you want very good measuring instruments. That's where the sextant comes in. Captain Cook goes off to Tahiti and elsewhere, and one of, the, or one of his voyages, he's testing the sextant, among other things. Um, and the sextant, um, well, and then there are printed tables of the distances from the moon to various star key stars, and you can do the math, and that's one way. The other way is to carry a good clock. 
Um, many people come up with clock designs or things that tell the time in one place from, you know, so that you could be in one place and know the difference in time where you are to the time at your at a starting point or a standard like Greenwich Mean Um and so there are many kinds of ideas proposed. Um, uh, John Harrison is a, one of the clock makers comes up with a number of really clever solutions, which I'm gonna get into the details here. And um, so by the end of the 18th century, we have a number of chronometer devices. And these evolve into uh, um, the 19th century, they start to look something like this. So they're, they're in a, uh, and this looks nothing like Harrison's, because his were just so complicated and expensive that he, people kept improving them to make something functional. So you have a box that's protecting your clock and a glass window here where you can see it without bringing it into the weather. And then um, this opens further down. And now we have, you can see the clock exposed. If you're gonna wind it, you would want to get down here. And um, when you're on the ship, it's in gimbal, so it can stay more level and help to keep better time. And there was, you know, there's a countdown dial, so you know you have when to wind it regularly, you know, each, usually each week or every so many, sometimes they're like 56 hours or what have you. They're different models. This is one from World War II, I think, um, for made by the Hamilton Company. So it's smaller, more compact. It was for you know wartime Navy use. Um, the earlier ones are bigger, more complicated, um, but they're all very expensive. So we still have like whaling ships are not going to carry one of these. The Merchant Marine is not really going to have these generally. So they're still relying on optics and sextants to estimate their longitude by moving distance. So we still have the, the you know, these two solutions in play. Um, so, oh, here's a, a chronometer um, from Harvard by, uh, from the mid um, 19th century. And the last little bit I want to talk about is how you found time. So one of the things one needed to do on a ship is you want, you know, you're carrying a clock that says it's this hour somewhere else, but okay, you need to know how many hours different you are from that. <laughs> so, you know, there were different methods. Um, one was to use a nocturnal, which um, you see here, which uses the rotation of stars are in a big dipper like the hands of a clock. And here is a, 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 the kind of nocturnal that is typically on ships in the um, 17th and 18th century. They're made of boxwood. And um, this one was owned by General Anthony Wayne, um, as it turns out. Um, but it's very typical in mariners often. And the other way was to use this kind of sundial, which is a known as a universal ring dial. And they could be pocket size, but for shipboard use, they were bigger. And these are great because they not only find the time by the sun, they also find true north. And this allows you to know how far your magnetic compass is not pointing to true north. And that's just a natural thing of compasses and on the earth where the magnetic field of the earth is not always true north. So this was a particularly useful sundial that you find on ships. And that's where I'm gonna close. And because uh, that's my last slide. And I'm happy to take questions. Um, and if you, I have some like, here's a cardboard nocturnal, you know, if you wanna try it out, um, looking at something. Um, but, um, I have some, you can come up and look at things. I'm happy to show you more details on them. 
and um, with the replicas, you're certainly welcome to handle those. Um, so thank you. Yes. I must say, this is a great history lesson. You are a 